Vista Children's Church. Beloved, this morning we have, the Lord has blessed us in sending a, uh, a dear brother to spend the weekend with us. So I have the privilege of introducing a, a brother in Christ whom I admire and have admired for a number of years. He's, um, you've probably listened to him, you've read his blogs, if you follow that. Um, I know a few men who think as accurately and clearly as Phil Johnson does. He's been a, he is the executive director of Grace to You, and he's been at Grace Community Church and Grace to You since 1983. Yesterday he was with us and preached for two hours, two separate hours, for two hours on Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and not only was it accurate, it was the clearest and most defensible exposition of that passage that I think you will ever hear. It's on our website, and I encourage you, I invite you to listen to it as soon as you can. It's a great delight for me uh, to introduce to you and welcome our preacher this morning, Phil Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, yesterday, I can't remember when I said it, but it was in passing, either in the message or the q and I made the remark that really the best part of heaven, the best thing in heaven is that we will get to see the glory of God, that we will experience God's glory in a way that's unimaginable, and, and I'm excited about that. I, that's what I look forward to most in heaven. I'm passionate about that. It's the very thing we're made for, to enjoy God and glorify him forever, and uh, I, I made that comment. It prompted me to think about this passage in John chapter 1, and that's where I want to go this morning. Recently, I, I spoke to a guy who said to me, you know, I'm a Christian, but I just I don't wear it on my sleeve. He said he's embarrassed, really, by the, by the reputation of evangelicals in America, America by our, our fervor. He said this world thinks Christians are fanatics, And the irony of it all was that he said that to me while he was wearing a jersey from his favorite sports team. He wouldn't wear his Christianity on his sleeve, but there was no question about which team he rooted for. And it is one of the supreme ironies of our culture that you can be as fanatical as you like about your favorite sports team. You can be wholly obsessed with some celebrity or pop star you've never even met, Or you can thoroughly immerse yourself in some mindless fantasy game, and no one bats an eye at that. But devotion to God is generally seen as a sign of serious imbalance, and an earnest worshiper of God might even be regarded by our culture as a deranged person, particularly if he declares his faith. I mean, the quintessential picture most people in our culture have of a a raving fanatic is the guy who stands on the street corner proclaiming the gospel, or anyone who's passionate about the glory of God. The truth is, if there's one thing we ought to be passionate about, it is the glory of God. There is no greater reality in all the universe. There is nothing more worthy of our deepest, most heartfelt emotion than God's glory. And as I said, this is the very end for which we were created, to relish the glory of God, to reflect on that glory, to to reflect it in our lives, and to rejoice in the privilege of basking in and declaring God's glory to the world. That, That is the very first answer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It says it like this, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, the glory of God, of course, is one of the central themes of Scripture. God's glory features prominently in all the major eras of Old Testament history. You have the visible Shekinah glory that led the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. You have the visible reflection of glory that made Moses' face shine when he came down from Sinai. You have the vivid descriptions of divine glory around the heavenly throne in Isaiah 6 and also in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10. And all of those passages in the Old Testament mention the visible palpable splendor of God's glory. And of course, the beauty of divine glory is 
is simply not conducive to verbal descriptions. It's indescribable. It's unimaginable. It's mysterious. And uh, if you want if you want a taste of that, read Ezekiel's descriptions in particular. The, Ezekiel gives us a kind of breathless narrative about bright lights and amazing angelic creatures and lightning flashes and and uh, intricate interconnected wheels with countless eyes and sparkling facets that he describes like like awesome crystal and colorful gemstones. It's an amazing description. It's a stunning vision. And speaking of passion, it provoked in Ezekiel terror and astonishment and unspeakable awe and great affection, deep humility, all kinds of passion. And as we read Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, as we read it without actually seeing what Ezekiel saw, it's really impossible to envision the spectacle. The most popular New Age theory is that Ezekiel was describing a massive UFO, you know, like a a scene out of Close Encounters or something like that. And of course, that's nonsense. I don't think any amount of special effects wizardry could accurately portray the majesty of what Ezekiel was describing. And his verbal description gives us really only the barest hint of it. All that really comes through in those verbal descriptions is a a sense of indescribable grandeur, beauty far beyond the reach of any human explanation, unfathomable radiance and infinite brilliance, and it, it, it is a vision that we cannot perceive from mere words. But between you and me, if you, can, if you can read Ezekiel's account of it and not have a passionate longing to see it with your own eyes, you must have a heart of stone. And it's clear from the Old Testament that a passion for the glory of God, this passionate interest in God's glory, is one of the key evidences of authentic faith. In fact, a yearning to see and perceive God's glory is perhaps the truest expression of authentic faith and genuine love for God. I can't wait to see the full display of God's glory with my own eyes, and I'll confess to you, the thought of it frightens and intimidates me, but I want it more than anything else in this world. That is the deepest hope of every true believer who thinks carefully about what really awaits us in heaven. And that has always been the hope of true believers. You see it in the Old Testament. Moses desperately wanted to see God's face, and even though he knew an unhindered look at the radiance of God would be fatal to him as a fallen creature, he begged God to let him see his glory. And in fact, Moses did get to see some of the glory of God through a shielded view from behind, And you remember as that glory receded, Moses got a a kind of small glimpse of the the back parts of God, the scripture describes it that way, and and the splendor of that little peak reflected with such a glow off his face that the people of Israel were frightened for their lives when they saw how Moses' face shone, and they begged him to cover it up with a veil. David, likewise, longed to see God's glory face to face, and in Psalm 17, verse 15, David said that was the one thing he knew would ultimately satisfy him, to behold God's glory. All his desires, all his longings, the object of his every passion lay in that one goal. He wanted an unhindered vision of the glory of God. No wonder. That's what we were created for. Humanity was created to enjoy and to reflect God's glory. Our race, you know, was supposed to be the perfect vehicle for God's likeness. We were designed to be living lanterns through which God's own glory would shine. And that is part of what Scripture means. That's a large part of what Scripture means when it says in Genesis 1.27 that God created man in his own image. Sin, of course, marred the image of God and left us with a deep longing for what Adam lost. And it's a longing, whether you realize it or not, that can only be satisfied by God's glory. And that's just another reason God's glory is the one thing in the universe that ought to inflame our passions more than any other thing. In other words, 
not only is God's glory inherently worthy of our affections, it's the very thing our affections were created for in the first place. And it's also the only thing that can ultimately satisfy our most basic urges and our most fundamental longings. And a lot of this life's frustrations and sins would be eliminated if we could just bear that in mind. One of the central truths of the New Testament is that the glory of God has now been revealed to us in a better way, in a different way, that won't kill us if we look it straight in the eye. But the fullness of God's glory is embodied in all its perfection in human form in the person of Christ. In other words, Jesus is what Adam was designed to be and more. He doesn't merely mirror the glory of God. He is the incarnation of it. And he lets us see not merely a fading reflection of divine glory the way Moses saw it. Christ personifies that glory in all its fullness. Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 1, 3 says it expressly. Christ is the radiance of the glory of God and the imprint of his, the exact imprint of his nature. And 2 Corinthians 3, 18 likewise says, we all with unveiled face, and it's contrasting us there with Moses, with, we with unveiled face behold in Christ the glory of God and we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Like Moses who reflected that glory, as we see and study and learn of Christ, the glory is absorbed by us and reflected by us and we're transformed by it. Now, consider how passionate those Old Testament saints were when they were privileged from time to time to glimpse mani visible manifestations of divine glory, always from behind veils or in cloudy or shadowy form, we ought to be much more passionate about the glory that's embodied in the person and the character of Christ because we can see that glory without any kind of veil on our faces. We can study it, in other words. We can enjoy it. And we can lift it up for the world to see. And that is what we ought to be most passionate about. Certainly it ought to stir our passions and our energies much more than some mud-spattered sports team whose glory, only glory, is worldly and meager and always fleeting. And particularly if you root for the same teams I do. But when we consider the glory of God, and especially when we realize how Christ is the very incarnation of that glory, it ought to put all our other passions in proper perspective. It ought to make us ashamed that what we are most passionate about is something else, that we're not really passionate enough about the one thing that ought to matter the most to us. We tend to imitate the world's passions. We invent gimmicks to try to win worldly people by appealing to their worldly passions, passions that, that aren't even worthy of our attention. We devote our energies and, and our emotions to those things, and we, we do things to stir artificial passions, which is really a form of false worship, no better than idolatry. Our passions, and particularly our passion for Christ, ought not to need to be artificially stirred up by you know, spiritual cheerleaders and stadium chants. We shouldn't have to be worked into an emotional state by melodrama and musical manipulation. If, if you can get pumped up to a fever pitch by some preacher's antics rather than by the truth of the biblical message, the, the, the glory that's embodied in the truth itself, then whatever emotion you feel is not a legitimate emotion in the first place. And by the way, the passions that are typically stirred by a clear vision of God's glory are not necessarily warm and comforting passions. It's not always a good feeling. In fact, it's much more likely that the first time someone catches a glimpse of God's glory, the result will be immediate fear, intense fear. And that's fitting because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Psalm 11.10. Psalm 
In fact, do a study on this in Scripture and take note of how people usually respond when they see God for who he is for the first time. They fall on their faces in sheer terror almost every time. God's glory provokes that kind of fear, but it also provokes profound amazement and wonder. Sometimes it's delight and rejoicing. Peter, you know, fell on his face and confessed his sin when he first began to realize who Jesus was, but he sounds almost giddy when he saw Christ's glory unveiled on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of those are legitimate passions, and if they are real, they will make a lasting difference in us. And this morning, I want to take you to a single text that speaks of the incarnation of God's glory and describes for us in as few words as possible what that glory is like. This is a familiar verse in the first chapter of John's gospel, uh, perhaps a verse that you know by heart. John 1, 14, verse 14, says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the Word in that text, of course, is Christ. He is both the starting point and the central focus of John's gospel. Unlike Matthew and Luke, John does not start his gospel with the human genealogy or the birth of Christ. He goes even further back. John goes as far back as it's possible to go into eternity past. And he starts actually in the same place as Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, at the dawn of creation, in that time before time. And John is giving us Jesus' divine pedigree, showing us that Christ is eternally God. And in fact, John states the case as explicitly as possible in more ways than one. He says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and, not, and without him was not anything made that was made. So it should be clear here that this is the creator, the one who made every created thing, and therefore, by definition, he cannot himself be a created being. And of course, the foundations of Trinitarian doctrine are established by this passage. And I don't, I don't think I need to defend the deity of Christ to most of you, I'm sure, but let's just note that this whole passage is a clear and unambiguous affirmation of the eternal deity of Christ. It's not just the phrase, the word was God, though that's important. That definitely states that Jesus was God, despite what the Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door will try to argue But if you take it in its context, every proposition in this passage affirms the deity of Christ, and John's main point in the extended passage is to declare that the glory of this person, whom he describes as the Word, the divine Logos, the glory he has is an innate, intrinsic glory. It's not a glory that was bestowed on him. It's not a created glory. It's not a reflected glory, but the Logos possesses the glory of God himself in all its fullness and ineffability. That's the only thing it can mean. Otherwise, it would be a, it would be a created glory. It would be a glory that was bestowed on him. But because it's his own glory, we know this is God. It cannot be any else otherwise. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That is the eternal glory of God, the light it talks about. And then follows verses 6 through 8, which talk about John the Baptist, whose mission, it says, was, verse 8, to bear witness about the light, to declare the glory of God in Christ. That's John the Baptist's message. Christ is, verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone, and John's mission was to announce that the light was coming into the world. Verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, were reborn, saved, delivered from the guilt and the condemnation of their sin. 
Now, I want you to see this. Everything, notice, everything from verse 6 through verse 13 is a digression. It's a crucial digression. This is John's first brief summary of gospel truth, but then in verse 14, he comes back to the point he started with. In the beginning was the Word, eternal God, the Creator, the eternal and only begotten Son of God. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14 completes that thought, and and this shows us where John was going from that first sentence, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, (coughs) full of grace and truth. Now, you may have heard, and this is true, that this uh, expression, dwelt among us, that is translated from a Greek expression that speaks of tent camping. The literal translation would say, he tabernacled among us. And it's a fitting word picture, because the glory of God filled the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35, when Moses completed construction of the original tabernacle, which was a big elaborate tent, basically. It was a portable temple made like a tent, and so it was called the tabernacle. Scripture says when it was completed and being dedicated, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Twice it says, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Likewise, when Solomon completed construction of the first permanent temple in Jerusalem, 2 Chronicles 7, verses 1 and 2 says this, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, that was his prayer of dedication, so again, tabernacle or the temple is being dedicated, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. You see the parallel between those two texts? Both of them say twice, the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house, the tabernacle, the temple. Likewise, in Ezekiel 10 verse 4, when when, that's Ezekiel's description of his vision of the glory of God, and it's a vision of heaven. It's a vision of the inner court of the heavenly tabernacle. And he writes this, And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Again, twice it says this heavenly tabernacle was filled with the glory of the Lord. And again, in Ezekiel 43, verse 5, Ezekiel says, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And then you can jump all the way to the end of the New Testament. In the Apostle John's apocalyptic vision of heaven, he says the very same thing. Revelation 15, verse 8. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Do you see this theme throughout Scripture? Every time there's a temple, a legitimate temple, the glory of the Lord is said to fill it. Wherever you have the presence of God in any tabernacle, the place is full of glory. And the same thing is true here. Christ's human body is a tabernacle that enables him to dwell with men as as a man himself, and yet he does this without divesting himself of his any aspect of his divinity. And naturally, this tabernacle too is full of glory. But notice this. John describes the glory of Christ in a distinctive way, and this is what I want you to notice. He says it's glory full of grace and truth. There are three key words in that expression. Glory, grace, and truth. And what I want to do this morning is spend some time with each one of those words. Everything up to this point is merely introduction. Now I want to get into the meat of this text, and we'll do it by considering one at a time each of those three key words, glory, grace, and truth. And we'll start with glory. Now I've already said quite a lot about this term, glory. But notice, I haven't even attempted to define it yet. 
John Piper, who has perhaps written more about the glory of God than anyone else in our generation, says this is a word that's impossible to define. He says it's not, it's not like a basketball, something with precise dimensions that you can touch and hold and even take a picture of or put it in a box. Piper says glory is more like the word beauty in, the, in that we know what it is, but there's no way adequately, adequately to express in words what it is, and I agree with that. In fact, glory is an even bigger concept with beauty than beauty, and everything you could possibly say about true beauty is just one aspect of what we mean when we speak of the glory of God. But Piper, though he says it's, it's impossible to define, he does set forth a kind of pro- provisional definition of Glory, understanding that you can't define this word adequately, here nevertheless is a short and to the point sort of provisional definition, and this is Piper's definition. He says, the glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of his manifold perfections. So in other words, you take all the attributes of God and look at the sheer perfection of those attributes, and that is the glory of God. That's what the glory of God is all about. Now, it's pretty hard to improve on that description, but as Piper himself said to begin with, the words don't really do justice to the concept. Scripture describes God as resplendent in his glory, unspeakably majestic, overpoweringly radiant, irresistibly powerful, consummately holy, exquisitely wonderful, breathtakingly awe-inspiring, and bright as light so you can't even look at it without it killing you. Glory is a shorthand word that sort of gathers up and includes all of those attributes and more. And a glimpse of the glory of God is simply the most compelling, most amazing, most terrifying, most beautiful sight human eyes could ever hope to see. God's glory is more moving, more exciting, more powerful than any other stimulus that ever stirred the human heart. You think about what kinds of things excite you and thrill you and terrify you. And God's glory does all of that in an even greater way. You cannot think rightly about the glory of God without being moved with the deepest kind of passion. And frankly, in one way or another, the glory of God stirs just about every legitimate passion you can name. God's glory is everything we ought to love. It summarizes and incorporates everything that really matters from eternity past to eternity future. It's the only thing that makes this world and all its fallen evil worth enduring. It's the one thing that makes sense of everything else. It's what God created everything for in the first place, for his glory. And this is where all creatures find their true and ultimate purpose. People always talk about, you know, what is our purpose? What is, our, what is my purpose in life? Your ultimate purpose in life is summed up in the glory of God. It's what you were made for, for God's glory. And we sometimes speak about giving God glory, and that's a biblical expression, jo- Joshua 7 verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. That was Joshua's appeal to Achan after he sinned, to repent. Give glory to God by repenting. And 1 Samuel 6, verse 5, give glory to the God of Israel. Isaiah 24, 15, therefore in the east, give glory to the Lord. In the coastlands of the sea, give glory to the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. So this is a common expression, give glory to God. That doesn't mean you and I could add something to God's glory or increase the splendor of his glory in any way by something we do. I mean, that would be impossible because his glory is already infinitely majestic, infinitely bright. There's no way you could add to it. But to give God glory, that biblical expression means to give God praise. We glorify God by ma- not by making him more glorious than he is. That, again, would be impossible. But we give him glory by declaring his glory with our lips and by reflecting his glory in our lives. And there is a 
necessary aspect of humility involved in giving God glory, which is why Joshua says to Achan, give God glory, and what he means is repent, humble yourself. We give God glory when we humble ourselves. You can see this very clearly in the book of Acts, Acts 12. Herod, you remember, was stricken down, and he died a very sudden and horrible death in front of a crowd who were in the process of shouting his praise in a way that offered him worship, the equivalent to worship. And Scripture says he was immediately struck down and eaten by worms. That's the expression Luke uses. And I gather it means that in a literal sense that he was infected by some, some bubonic form of flatworms that, that do incubate in the human body and uh, in larval form they, they group up in a mass like a tumor. And sometimes when that mass of larvae bursts, it, the, the worm larvae go through the body and cause intense pain followed by a really quick death, but it's not as quick as you wish it would be. It takes about an hour or so to die from, from that, that sort of thing. Acts 12.23 says that's what happened to Herod because, it says, he did not give glory to God. That's why he was struck down in such a horrific way. He tried to claim glory for himself that belongs to God. And as Luke describes it, he was in the very act of accepting worship from his subjects as if he were God incarnate. He was stealing God's glory. And so God struck him down. Now, think about that. Scripture says that happened to him because he did not give God the glory. So the opposite of what Herod was doing, receiving worship, that would be what it means to give give glory to God to declare his glory, to worship him, to humble ourselves, to acknowledge that God alone is worthy of all praise, to fear and yet to adore the grandeur of his glory, to praise him with our minds and hearts and lips, and to reflect his glory in the humble and obedient way we live our lives. That's what it means to give glory to God, and that is exactly how Christ manifested the glory of God as a man, except that instead of reflecting the glory of God, Jesus literally embodied and radiated with that glory. As our text says, he was full of grace and truth. Again, the glory filled the tabernacle of his body. It's one of the reasons I believe in the impeccability of Christ. In other words, Christ could not sin. He would not sin. There was never any risk that he might sin because there was nothing in him that sin could appeal to. In John 14, verse 30, Jesus himself said, the ruler of this world has nothing in me. He was full of grace and truth. So in Christ, there was no evil motive. There was no sinful desire. There were no erroneous beliefs. There was none of our fallenness. Nothing Satan could exploit against Christ. And no claim the devil could make against him. He was quite simply full of grace and truth. Now, that's not true of you or me, none of us. We're not full of grace and truth. And in fact, in our fallen state, we are utterly devoid of both grace and truth. Utterly dependent on the Spirit of God to supply those virtues for us. And only as we trust Him can can we truly reflect His glory the grace and the truth. But that's here's what I want you to notice about this. There is a distinct difference between the many ways God's glory was manifest in the Old Testament and the way that glory is brought to us in the New Testament. You know, the Old Testament manifestations of divine glory always centered on the sparkle and the spectacle of visible radiance. You have the cloud of Shekinah glory, which illuminated the camp of Israel at night, and I presume that even in the daytime when that cloud was, Scripture calls it a cloud that led the the Israelites through the wilderness, I presume that same cloud shone with a peculiar radiance that made it not like any of the other clouds in the sky. You, 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 otherwise, how do they know which cloud to follow? You have the glow that lit up Moses' face in, in reflection. That was so powerful, it took time to diminish. 
You have the gemstones and wheels and crystals and lightning flashes in Ezekiel's vision. Everything the glory of God touches in the Old Testament glows or shines or sparkles or flashes in some way. The stress in the Old Testament is always on visible radiance. Now, the other aspects of God's glory are all there, of course, but when you think of glory in the Old Testament, what stands out are the bright physical displays of visible divine luminescence. Glory is always pictured as blinding, stunning, like the brightest conceivable light. Now, of course, that is the very same glory in the New Testament, and so even here in John 1 and throughout the Gospel of John, the divine glory is repeatedly spoken of as light. The light of men, verse 4. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, verse 5. Christ himself is the true light, which enlightens everyone. But the stress here, it seems to me, is not on literal, visible brilliance, physical light. The emphasis here is on spiritual light, that which enlightens us with grace and truth. And now, that in no way alters or diminishes the physical brilliance of divine glory. And in fact, on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, in one stunning moment during his earthly ministry, Christ pulled back the veil of his humanity and allowed Peter, James, and John to see the physical manifestation of his glory as he shone from head to foot with a glow that must have been impossible to stare at with the eyes of flesh. Matthew 17 verse 2 says, He was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. So even his clothes were transformed by by being touched by that glory. And he was bright as light shone like the sun. It it, it was a glow you, you couldn't stare at. And so when John says, we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the Father, I am certain that the glory of the transfiguration is at least a key aspect of the point he's making. He saw that glory in its fullness in a way most of the disciples weren't even privileged to see it. And by the way, the expression John uses here is a definitive affirmation of the deity of Christ. Christ's glory, John says, was the glory of God himself. He calls it glory as of the only Son from the Father. And of course, in that Semitic culture, in any Middle Eastern culture, even to this day, the full-grown son of a king is not of lesser stature than the king himself. But the king's son was treated with the same respect that's owed to the king, and particularly after he became an adult, the son was deemed one with the king and equal in stature, and that is why in John 5, when Jesus calls God my father, verse 18 of John 5 says, the Jews sought to kill him because he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so, in fact, the Jews would sometimes use the expression, our father, when they prayed, or because the Old Testament portrayed God as a father, an adoptive father to Israel. But Jesus spoke of God as his own father, which was a whole different matter. And the, the Jewish people listening to him understood he was making himself equal with God. He was de- declaring his deity when he said God was his own father. And that's an important point of theology. John underscores it here by saying that the glory of Christ is glory as of the only Son from the Father. Emphasis on the word only. The Greek term there is monogenes, which means one of a kind, or or more literally, and in King James terms, only begotten. We are, you and I, believers, are adopted sons of God, and he is our father in that sense. But Christ stands alone as the only begotten son of God. He is eternally begotten. He's not, in other words, not conceived or created. He is eternal, just as God is. But in some ineffable sense, he is eternally begotten of the Father, and therefore eternally he stands in relationship to the Father as a -a one-of-a-kind son equal to God, God himself. 
And all of that is wrapped up in what John is saying here. And his point is that the glory of God is, that the glory of Christ is the glory of God. He's not saying it's like God's glory. He's not saying it's merely a reflection of God's glory. He's not saying it's some kind of lesser but similar glory. He is saying what Jesus himself said to Philip in John 14, 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Christ's glory is the glory of God incarnated and put on display for us in human form. But it's significant, I think, that what John describes in the next phrase is not the brightness of physical light, it's not a glow like the brightness of the sun, but John here seems deliberately to bring out the moral beauty of God's glory more than the physical glow of it. Here is John's description of the glory of God as seen in the incarnation of Christ. It is glory full of grace and truth. Full of grace and and truth. Those, of course, are the other two key words we want to examine from this text. First, glory, and I've described the idea of divine glory to the best of my ability with human language in such a short time, and I confess to you that everything I've said falls far short of doing justice to the glory of God. We can't really do justice to the glory of God, but we we await that day when we see it with our own eyes. For now, we have to move on. First, glory. Now look at the word grace. In fact, I almost hate to, to break up this pair of words because the linkage is important. Grace and truth. These always go together in Scripture. Grace, of course, is God's blessing freely bestowed on fallen sinners who deserve the exact opposite. We talked about that yesterday if you were here. Grace is the blessing of God given freely to people who deserve the opposite. Truth is reality as seen from God's perspective. That's the simplest definition of truth I know. It's reality as God sees it. That's what's true. And more precisely, and let me borrow here a statement from John MacArthur's book, The Truth War. He says this, quote, Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. Even more to the point, he says, truth is the self-expression of God. Now, we tend to think of truth as something harsh and unyielding, and then we think of grace as something tender and forgiving. And those two words evoke such different ideas in our minds that we have a hard time bringing them together. Still, as I said, you read Scripture and you will discover those two terms are inextricably linked throughout Scripture. Try to divorce them and you destroy both concepts. Think of it this way. Grace itself is an expression of God's character and so it cannot be in conflict with truth because God himself defines truth. And the reverse is true as well. You try to eliminate grace from the concept of what's true, and you just it's not true anymore. So, because these two words seem to be in conflict in so many ways, they, they evoke such different ideas in our minds, we tend to try to classify them as rivals. We treat them as competing values, and if we're not careful, we begin to think of them as incompatible virtues. And in fact, there is an almost irrepressible human tendency to try to split these two ideas as if they were complete opposites, hostile to one another. You can hear that kind of thinking embodied in the rhetoric of postmodern, you know, apostate evangelicalism, the emergent church movement, and in fact, I would say this is perhaps the defining, the defining characteristic of emergent religion. It is an attempt to pit grace against truth. Emergents have, have elevated a twisted notion of grace that is practically devoid of any real concern for the truth. And so, emergent and postmodern writings labor to portray grace as a virtue you know, that should take precedence over truth, especially sound doctrine or propositional truth claims, or objectivity itself. And it's common nowadays for people to characterize truth as something that's utterly hostile to grace and incompatible with it. And that is because they don't have a biblical notion of grace. 
Again, grace speaks of undeserved kindness and divine blessing, sovereignly and freely bestowed on sinners who deserve the opposite. Grace is the most benevolent and generous of all the divine virtues, but grace, by definition, is neither automatic nor universal. God is sovereign in the dispensing of his grace. And when God does show grace to sinners, one of the key benefits that comes with that blessing is the, is the lesson described in Titus 2, verse 12, which says grace teaches us that denying ungodliness, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And further, according to Titus 2.14, Grace redeems us from all iniquity and purifies us unto God. So authentic grace is never apathetic about truth. And grace certainly cannot be reduced to the idea of friendship with the world or camaraderie with the enemies of God. In other words, grace doesn't mean always being nice and friendly, especially towards sworn enemies of the truth. And although Jesus was full of grace... He wasn't always tender and mild. In fact, we have that, you know, we we sing songs or say poems about gentle Jesus, meek and mild. I would say mild is probably the most inappropriate adjective that's ever been applied to Christ. There's nothing mild about him, but he was full of grace. In fact, even his harshest public denunciations of the Pharisees had a gracious purpose. Those were life-giving words, and although the tone may have been stern or even angry, those were liberating diatribes, especially for people who had lived their entire lives in bondage to the pharisaical system, that legalism that kept people in bondage. Jesus was speaking grace even when he rebuked the Pharisees. And we shouldn't think of grace as something different from that. Now, here's an interesting fact. In all of the Gospel of John, you can read the entire Gospel of John, and you will discover the word grace appears only four times. And all of them are found in this short pericope that begins in verse 14 and ends with verse 17. Look at it. You have the word grace once in verse 14, twice in verse 16, and then once more in verse 17. That's it. Outside those three verses, the Apostle John never uses the word grace anywhere in his gospel. Now, by contrast, the word truth is one of the key words in all of Johannine theology. You'll find the word truth 25 times in the gospel of John alone and and 20 more times in the three short epistles of John. However, that's not to suggest that John downplays grace or omits the con- concept. You see vivid displays of divine grace in practically every chapter of John's gospel as John traces the ministry of Christ from incident to incident. It's all about grace. There's the, the grace he showed to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. The word grace isn't there, but grace covers that chapter. Grace to the man born blind in John 9. Grace as he washes the disciples' feet in John 13, and so on. You you read John's gospel, and you will see the whole thing reads like a commentary on the expression, full of grace. That is how John portrays Christ throughout, gracious towards sinners, and relentlessly aggressive in his opposition against the enemies of truth. And that is authentic grace in action. It's... It's the handmaiden of truth. It's not the enemy of truth. Now, in fact, let's consider the third word in this trilogy. Glory, grace, and now truth. Look at the verse again. We beheld his glory, John writes, full of grace and truth. One of the most appealing features of Christ's glory is the way his lavish grace never clouds his love for the truth. In fact, Christ embodied truth itself, and that's one aspect of John's point here. Jesus, you know, said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he is truth incarnate. 
He's the very embodiment of truth. That's what John is implicitly saying when he calls Jesus the divine Logos. That's one of the main connotations of that name, Logos, the Word, the Word of truth. Jesus is truth incarnate. But that's not all this expression signifies. Jesus was a proclaimer and an expositor and a defender of the truth. In John 8, 45, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. He frequently contrasted the truth of his teaching with the lies of the Pharisees. And listen to the very last words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 37, Jesus says, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, Jesus says. So, grace and truth defined his earthly mission. He came not only to seek and to save the lost, yes, to do that, certainly, but also to bear witness to the truth. Those who lack a passionate concern for the truth cannot honestly claim to be passionate about the glory of God. And Christ is our model in that. And and he was no, no model of these worldly notions of artificial collegiality and superficial charitableness towards people who corrupt or oppose the truth of the gospel. He opposed them. He refuted them. He said they were wrong because that's the gracious and true thing to do. Now, one other point, and then I'll close. Notice that these same twin concepts appear again in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, this is a Frequently misunderstood text. The law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Christ. John is not saying that the Mosaic covenant was devoid of either grace or truth. He's not saying these were new concepts that Christ brought and taught us. He's certainly not saying that Moses gave a different way of salvation through legal means when he says the law came through Moses. He's not saying the law as a way of salvation, nor is he saying that divine grace was a new concept introduced by Christ. Nor is he saying that Christ overturned or nullified the moral principles that are taught in Moses' law. Some people say that. It's not what Jesus, that's not what this verse means and not what Jesus did. And in fact, everyone who has ever been saved has been saved by grace through faith. That is the whole point of Romans chapter four to demonstrate that even before the law of Moses And under the law of Moses, people who were saved were saved by grace through faith, not because of their legal obedience. And faith, by definition, lays hold of the truth. The law itself was a revelation of truth, and one of its purposes was to leave sinners with no other hope besides grace. The law was given to condemn us, but for a gracious purpose, to to drive us to grace, to drive us to the necessity of grace. And so both grace and truth were vital concepts, even under the Mosaic Covenant. So what does John mean when he says the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ? Here's what he means. He's saying that the prominent feature of the Mosaic Covenant was law. The law itself has no saving efficacy. The law offers no help to fallen sinners. And in fact, it condemns them to death. But the law itself is holy and just and good. Paul says that in Romans 6. And the law was given for a good purpose, both to teach us about the righteousness of God and to remove any hope we might have of trying to save ourselves apart from God's grace. So grace and truth were crucial features in the Old Testament, but they weren't the dominant features. By contrast... Grace and truth are the whole substance of the new covenant. That's why it's a better covenant. Because the old tabernacle, you know, contained scrolls of law. The new tabernacle is full of grace. The old tabernacle was filled with types and figures. The new tabernacle is full of truth. Christ is superior to the law in every sense. And that, of course, is the heart of the gospel message. Whereas 
the law rebukes our sin and threatens us with eternal punishment, Christ paid the price of sin, and he offers the water of life freely. And that means my salvation from sin is an expression of divine glory. God is glorified by making me a joint heir with Christ, even though what I really deserve is punishment forever in hell. God has expressed his glory in Christ in a way that washes every believer completely clean of all sin and guilt, and God's glory is magnified in the outworking of his redemptive work. And if that's not reason enough for you to be passionately, zealously, earnestly enthralled with the glory of God, you need to pray for a new heart. The glory of God, I cannot wait to see it in heaven, in all its fullness, and see the very thing I was made for. Let's pray. Father, we confess that too often we forfeit the benefits of your grace because we consume ourselves and invest our energies in things that aren't worthy of our passions. Give us a true glimpse of your glory so that our hearts might be melted with genuine passion, that our very souls might be transfigured from glory to glory in the perfect likeness of Christ, our Savior, who is the incarnation of glory. We come to you in his name with the earnest expectation that you will hear and answer. Amen.